ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure now uh, to introduce a great national advocate for civil society. I'm of course talking about Eva Cox, AO, public commentator, change agent, passionate feminist. She presented the Boyer Lectures on ABC Radio National in 1995, a truly civil society with the name of those Boyer Lectures, because we've got some young'uns here today who won't have heard them, but she has been working for civil society ever since and continues to do so. She's involved in setting up a good society network to make society more civil and currently is working in, on, in an honorary position at the University of Technology at the Indigenous House of Learning, Jumbana. Please welcome Eva Cox. I'd like to start by paying my respects to the First Nations that actually came to Australia long before any of us did and had a much better attitude towards what science was about. It was integrated into their lives in the same way that the arts were integrated into their lives. They had a coherent view of what mattered and they didn't separate it out in ways which allowed you to sort of turn the arts into something which is just a form of commerce, turn, turn the science into something which you could just ignore. I think we need to get back to the idea and learn from the for Indigenous people how to put a holistic culture of who we are and what we are and make a real effort to understand everything within a broad context and not divide it into bits. So. What I want to start with is a phrase I've been using a lot because I think it's actually really cogent to what we're trying to talk about. We live in a society, not an economy. Parche, John. I know we've just had the economist talking. But I think we need to seriously think about the fact that we have lost a lot of the ideas which makes us social beings. When's the last time you heard people talking about a common good? Talking about things that are social well-being? We talk entirely in material terms about the economy, about gross domestic product, which is gross, not domestic, and definitely in many cases non-productive. So, and I want to bring this up because I think there's a serious issue here that we need to understand. As I say, I'm a sociologist, and I know one of the things about sociology and the social sciences generally, again, part of the economists, is unlike some of the hard sciences, and I know there's debates about uncertainty principles there too, but the social sciences is deal with the probability of human beings behaving in particular ways. We have very few rules in, in the social sciences, which economists don't understand, which says if A, therefore B. Causality is much more complex when we're dealing with human society. And that's one of the problems we've got at the moment. We have subjected the population of most of the Western democratic countries and some others, including China, with the idea that what counts is economics, which is about materialism, particularly the neoliberal model. It's about traded goods and traded services. It doesn't deal with unpaid work. It doesn't deal with ethics. It doesn't deal with feelings. It doesn't deal with emotions. It doesn't deal with the fact that human beings are social beings. And what's important to us is who we are, where we are, who we are connected to, where we belong, that we're respected, that we have a sense of agency, that we both are being taken care of and we can contribute. Now, the reason I'm raising this is because I think one of the things that's very important, and I'm going to throw this challenge out to everybody here, is one of the reasons we have this huge populist movement at the moment in every area that you can think of is because we have actually lost sight of the fact that we're a society. Those in power have only talked about the individual and the fact that we are all self-interested dead shits who are there in order to provide for ourselves. So we have no sense about being social, no sense about being connected despite the fact human beings are connected. We are born very connected, literally. That's one thing that women know about. And we have a long period of growing up where we need other people. And what we need to do is recognise that that sense of belonging, that sense of being connected, that sense of being valued 
is really important to who we are and how we feel about ourselves. And one of the things that I think economics has done is it has undermined for a lot of people in the community the sense that we have a community. It's undermined the idea that government is there to serve the people. It only confirms the fact that government is there to serve the economy. We keep cutting social programs. We buggered up childcare because it only is available now for women who have got jobs, paid jobs. We put paid work on a pedestal as though it's the only thing that matters. We've moved away from the idea that the contributions that we make unpaid in relationships and things don't matter. And government is not seen as something that's there that owns things and shares things and takes care of people. It was always a bit dicey in that area, but at least it was there. Now you can't even find government departments there online. They don't offer services anymore, they contract them out. So it's disappeared from view. So people don't trust government, and guess what? They don't trust other people in authority. Populism is a big sign, which you can go back to the 1930s and look at, is when people lose faith in the democratic system and they lose faith in the people that are running the place and the people in power really lose faith, then they start looking for people like them. That's when you get nationalism, that's when you get fascism, that's when you get Nazism, that's when you get some of the anti-Muslim type stuff that we're hearing at the moment with this stupid crap about Australian values. When I raised it this morning, I was on ABC News 24 with Anne Henderson, and I raised the fact that all of the stuff that they were crapping on about these questions on Australian values were designed to target Muslims and make people feel bad about the fact that they couldn't be Australian citizens. And I really thought it was important that we actually recognise that this was racist. She said, but you've got to respond to what the people want. And my response to that was, try 1930s Germany. And she then said to me, oh, you're raising the Hitler thing. And I said, I'm entitled to because I was actually a victim of Hitler. I'm a refugee child. I was born three weeks before Hitler marched into Vienna to Jewish parents, which was a bad choice. So we had to get out of there. And I just think we need to remember what happens when a civilised country loses its sense of of belonging into a sort of much more than just a nation which is actually on about itself. That's what happened, and we've got to make sure it doesn't happen here. The revolt against... So the revolt against science, like the revolt against a lot of other things which are about knowledge and understanding, are a sign of people who feel desperately insecure and want to only associate with people like them. It's no use abusing them. It's no use calling them uneducated and stupid and all of the other things. If we start doing that, we add to the damage. Because many of them aren't. They're people who are bewildered, confused, and don't know what to do. One of the things that we do have to do, and this is the challenge I'm throwing out to you, is if we are serious about trying to rebuild the deficit in trust of other people, which is at the basis of all of this prejudice and nastiness, the de trust deficit that is much worse than the bloody stupid uh, budget deficit, is something that we need to start rebuilding. And if we're going to rebuild that, rather than just protesting, which is important and it's a good way of catching up and, and creating energy, we also need to build alternatives. At the moment, unfortunately, the progressive side of politics is more tied up with objecting to what it doesn't like, and we have to put our heads together and work out what we do like. Protests don't work unless you have alternatives. So I want to throw out the challenge here is taking on the fact that human beings are not perfect and not predictable, taking on the fact that we have a really serious problem with trust and, individ and the sense of belonging in a diverse area, so people are shrinking it back into people like me. What we need to do to say there are alternatives, we need to put the idea of utopia back on the thing. Somebody said to me, but that's dumb stuff. I thought, no, utopia, and I'm using Oscar Wilde's definition, is the next island to the one you just landed on. In other words, it's a vision of the fact that we can create positive change. 
And the message that needs to come out of a lot of this stuff is not despair, but the fact that change is possible, because if change isn't possible, if you tell people horror stories about what's going to happen in the environment and the death and end of everything, people stop listening. If you want people to listen, you've got to say, yes, we have these crises, but there are ways out. And if you can't, if they're not out there now, bloody well think of them and work them out because that's the only way we're going to fix it. Thank you.